Welcome to Energy Stew. This is Peter Roth, your host. And I'd like to ask you, have you been concerned about loss of memory? Perhaps not your own, but friends or family. And that's a big deal in life these days, and probably historically as well. But right now, there's so many people who are suffering from memory loss and deeply often and progressively often and it's something that we want to talk about in this show to offer maybe some hope some opportunity some quality of life that has to do with you you don't lose it all when you lose your memory but you lose a lot and we're going to talk with someone who has really become an expert in the field. Uh, he, um, he'll have a book out about this. And I'm so excited. He's been a guest on the show a couple of times before, and I love ha talking with him. He's the uh, author of um, a book that we talked about that he wrote before called God and Love on Route 80. And this is about God and Love. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Could with you please repeat it? God in love with memory loss. And Siri thought I was talking to her on my phone just now. Um, hopefully that won't happen again. <laughs> but um, sorry for the distraction. Um, so memory loss. And you have a very important role to play because you're a, a, a doctor, doctor of divinity actually, but at a medical school. So you're here to help people deal with life issues, soul issues, having to do with our consciousness and, or loss of it even. And, and so I'm so excited to ask you, uh, you know, and see what you can tell us about um, what you call uh, deeply forgetful which is another word for memory loss. And there are other words for it too, right? There certainly are other words. Deeply forgetful people suggests more continuity because we are all, like it or not, at times somewhat forgetful, sometimes more, sometimes less. And we apologize a bit to the person whose name we for God, even though they're our neighbor. So some people are more deeply forgetful than, than others. And I like the word, it's the, that, that expression, because sometimes the word dementia uh, is used uh, very derisively. Well, I think often, and it, it derives from the word demented. Yes. And, and that means people aren't very smart right and when people have memory loss they might feel not very smart and certainly and you have you talk a lot uh, you sent me an outline of of your work about this and you talk a lot about how we value cognition yeah so i've been working with deeply forgetful people and caregivers really for about 30 years. My grandmother, by the way, even before that, had what was quite clearly Alzheimer's disease, although at that time it was called senile dementia. Um, and when I would interact with her, I always felt, even to the end, that there was a presence. I didn't have the audacity to think that she was gone, absent, a shell, a husk, dead, and whatever. Uh, and I think that's because I never overvalued um, linear reasoning and cognition. So I, I coined the terms deeply forgetful people, but also I coined the term hypercognitive values. People who are hypercognitive put all the moral consideration and the dignity 
of a human being on their cognitive dexterity, their polish, their ability <laughs> to kind of lay out plans and operationalize. And how smart you are. Yeah, how smart the smarter you are, the more you're respected. The more you're respected. And, you know, in Germany, um, during the Holocaust, they had a super hypercognitive program called T4, or Tiergestrasse 4. And they took 70,000 people in 1939 out of the asylums. About half of them were people with progressive dementia. And they left them to freeze in the cold air, in the cold water, in the snow, lying down on the ice outside. And then they would bring them back into the asylums and thaw them out in different mediums at different temperature ranges. And these were the beginning of the so-called hypothermia experiments. And these people were not gypsies. They were not Jews. They were not Polish Catholics. They were not gay folks. They were of the blood. They were pure Aryans. They were German pure blood people, but they had something going against them, which was that they were uh, deep, more deeply forgetful than others, and they were not cognitively uh, respected. And so that actually is a very serious problem. That program at T4, which was run by the best German doctors of the time, it ended after about a year, because even the German people themselves decided it was totally unacceptable, but they moved it to Dachau, and they moved it to Auschwitz, and they perpetrated it primarily on the Jews. That's terrible, and but it's an example of of the lack of respect for people who appear to be unable to sometimes talk mm -hmm. or even follow directions for long. Um, I guess they're, they're, well, we're going to talk about different ways that people remain awake. Yes. Even though they seem to be asleep. Yeah. I just think that the Western world, philosophically, Locke, Kant, agency, moral consideration, everything has to do with having a clear, rational mind. And and if you, by the way, if you go too far with that, most of us on any given day right. are going to be in, in the river. You know? right. <laughs> and there's a school in France that calls it micro-psychosis. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But for me, it's consciousness. You know, it's the fact that people can be deeply forgetful. Uh, they can have all kinds of cognitive disabilities, um, they can be um, uh, autistic individuals who have no speech, they can be people with dementia, uh, but they're aware of their environment. They can have tremendous emotional sensibility. They can respond to uh, nature, they can appreciate beauty, uh, they can dance, they can be uh, uh, help to remember a song from earlier in life and they can brighten up and be right there. So for me, consciousness, just that simple meta-awareness of consciousness is always there. Even if somebody doesn't have their, their kind of linear reasoning intact. And it can be very deep and, and very difficult for family and friends when you're not recognized. Well, that's a big benchmark, absolutely. So, you know, I've been working, let's say, for 30 years with, with family caregivers, and the thing that always comes up is, well, I don't want to visit Grandpa anymore because he doesn't remember my name. And that, to me, is very sad because, I, you know, I'm in a medical school here at Stony Brook. I Just on the escalators, I run into two or 300 people a day, and I remember some names and not others. I'm sorry, you know. I mean, remembering a name is important. It's symbolic. It suggests relationality and so forth. But, you know, really, um, it's not that important. And typically, if you approach somebody who is struggling with dementia, they can't remember your name. But if you call them by name, 
and you make eye contact and maybe you touch them on the hand, don't be surprised if in fact they will remember your name. Because I had that experience many times with my grandmother. Somehow by being present there, it brought my mem the memory of my name back to her and she could say, hey, little Stevie. Wow. But he, I want to say that even if they can't even recognize your face, because the name is one thing, uh, vision is another. And let's say we, we get discouraged about visiting a friend or family because they don't know who we are. I think it's, it's selfish, really, to think that they have to recognize us instead of us just wanting to pour love on them. 100% I agree. The, you know, um, sometimes people have said, I know one elderly man who went to the nursing home to visit his his wife, who was quite severely uh, forgetful, and she was just there, not communicating. Someone asked him, "So why do you bother? Why do you bother to visit here?" And and he said, "Well, the main thing is that I know who she is, and she can." sense my presence, she can be loved, she can pick up the tone of my voice. And I call her by name, not expecting an answer, but open to the possibility that one may come. But what's important is that I love her. And then he added, I also believe that underneath this communicative breakdown, she still loves me. I love that. And and I know, actually, I know a man, a senior citizen, whose wife uh, developed Alzheimer's. And it was a long stage of development. And he gave up everything in, in his other life to care for her. And he was so dedicated and so loving. It was beautiful to watch him take care of her. And I, I had that experience to see him do that. So I believe that <clears throat> caregivers are the salt of the earth. They're the <clears throat> glue of our world. You know, we all think that we're self-reliant, you know, <laughs> sort of Emersonian, like individuals, and we're independent. But the reality is that we all come into this world and we're totally dependent for a long period of time. And when we get ill and frail, we're dependent again. And when we get older, most of us, unless we die very suddenly, are dependent on others. And so interdependence is the whole core of human experience. And compassion is really best defined, Thomas Merton defined compassion as a very keen sense of the interdependence of all things. And so even when someone is deeply forgetful, they're no different than we are. They're dependent. And it's our relationships with them, our ability to care for them, not to say that we should do so much that we lose our own health and well-being. We need support. We need uh, respite and so forth. But in the final analysis, you know, uh, we, all, we all get so frightened because we think, oh, my goodness, you know, if, like your friend, you know, to be a caregiver would change my whole life around. Actually, a lot of caregivers don't describe their experience as just a dreary burden, but they actually are open to surprises. They notice things and they begin to connect with deeply forgetful people in ways that are actually um, quite impressive and even at times uh, joyful. Yeah, because they see what can, they can bring out in the person of, of their spirit. And I think that's really what we want to understand is that often there's a difference between mind and spirit. Yes. That we're, we're not looking for mental clarity. We're, we're looking to, for the soul, just for the soul of the person to reveal itself. Yeah, so about five years ago, I, I went to Bangalore in India, which has a really cool airport, by the way. <laughs> and uh, that's where the Indian National Institute for Advanced Studies is located. 
and they were having a conference on on dementia and deep forgetfulness. They actually took the title from my own work. And I gave this presentation. There were about 80 people in the room. Half of them were mostly Hindu neuroscientists, and then the other half were mainly Hindu philosophers, but people like Owen Flanagan from Duke and others here were, were, were there. And, and, and I said, you know, what really matters is our respect for their consciousness. When you go into a meditational state, you actually try to let the thoughts drift out of your mind, like clouds drifting out of the sky. You try to empty your mind and just be aware, just be subtly aware of the world around you. So uh, I said what's really important is to honor people for their consciousness. Now, of course, they may become brain dead by definition, and that's a different story. So mindless consciousness, just like we strive for in meditation. Yeah, mindless consciousness, absolutely. And so there they are. And, and I said, we, we can respect that, we should respect that. And His Holiness sometimes comes to Bangalore and hangs out at the Indian Institute. And he actually walked in, and nobody even noticed him much, because I guess he's a pretty regular feature. The Dalai Lama. Yeah, yeah, the Dalai Lama came in. And after I spoke, he put his hand down on the desk, and he said, absolutely. In a very strong term, he said, there's no reason to respect the consciousness of someone whose memory is intact more than the consciousness of someone who is deeply forgetful. That's beautiful. <laughs> and, and, of course, I was... I was pretty, pretty impressed. Got a couple of pictures, <laughs> oh, <good>. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I believe. And, 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 and uh, I, I, I think that we are so narrow sometimes about who is a part of the human family, you know, and, and I'm very inclusive and, and I owe that that's the silver lining as a kid of having a grandmother, grandma post with, with Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> Right. But I think one of the signs of advanced consciousness is, is to see the soul in everybody. Yes. And to, and to respect it. And so what we're, we're extending it to now are people who can't give it back. Yeah. And, and except for their responses, you know, and, and I think what we're talking about are the ways that that we can show that. Now you have a list that I that I um, that you sent me of twelve aspects to the enduring self, mm -hmm. and these I think we should go over these so people can understand what the enduring self can possess even without great cognitive function. Very much so, and you know. Um... I, so I, I worked a lot, maybe 15, 20 years ago, with the Alzheimer's art therapy movement. And I was in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, one morning at one of these programs, because I did a lot to help set it up nationally. And there was a guy who'd come in for a couple of mornings, and he had a pencil and a piece of paper, uh, and, and, and he... Um, he just drew this chaotic image, but there was a line down the middle, you know? And it, it, um, three days in a row, he put this line down the middle, and I would ask him, Jack, what's that line? He couldn't respond at all. But then one morning I was sitting there and he said, this is a map so my daughter can find my house. Wow. <laughs> now that blew everybody away and it got in the newspapers nationally, okay? Because right. uh, they were doing a special feature and it really was captivating. But And even at that time, maybe if his daughter showed up, he wouldn't respond to her clearly. Right. But there was something in him that knew that his daughter's house was an important place in his life. He was still relational, just, you know, regardless of all things. And he was also creative. Another story that I, I, I've never forgotten, and it's so vivid, it's like I'm right, it's happening right now. So I went with, I had a great neurology mentor at Case Western Med. I taught there for 20 years, Dr. Joseph Michael Foley. And uh, we went to a nursing home called Heather Hill 
in Chardon, Ohio. We went into this special care unit where you got people with pretty advanced dementia. And there's usually 20, 25 people in these units. And I read the little bio sketch on the door of one of the people in the unit. His name was Jim. And it said he had a couple of kids. It said what he'd done for a living and so forth. And then I asked the nurse to point him out to me. So we went out into the unit and uh, she said, there's Jim. And I went over to Jim and I quietly took him over to a table. I sat down next to him and I, I asked him, Jim, how are your sons? How's Bill? And he couldn't respond. I said, uh, how's Joe? He couldn't respond. But then he had a twig in his hand. He had a beautiful white painted twig in his hand that was about two feet long. And he handed it to me. And when he handed it to me, this guy smiled so effusively that if joy was electric, the place would have been on fire. And I held this thing, and he was just so joyful. It was so intense. And then I gave it back to him. And later on, I asked the nurse, what was the story with Jim's twig? And she said, well, he grew up on a farm in Western Ohio and his father loved him very much. And he had a chore in the morning, which was to bring kindling in for the fireplace. And like a lot, about two thirds of people with dementia will go back to that time earlier in their life that they most identify with tender, loving care. It's all about attachment and getting away from the buzzing chaos of the moment and retreating into a place of peace. And so his spirit was peaceful. And he still had rationality in the symbolic sense of rationality, not linear rationality. Right. He couldn't talk about his sons, but no. he could represent the, the, the caring that he felt from his father in having this this daily habit that he had with him that, yeah right that brought him back to home and family so when you ask him about his kids he gives you this his twig and it really means this is family absolutely and there's so many issues i mean I, one of my friends david keck's father leander keck taught new testament at yale university for many many years and his wife janet dave's mom became uh, severely demented, and she would wander around uh, the campus a bit, you know, the Divinity School area. Most people knew her, and so they could guide her around if she got lost. And she got to a point where she really couldn't communicate at all, but she would go to that chapel on the Yale Green, you know, and, and she would chime in to the hymns, because those were things that she deeply engaged with earlier in life, and they were so meaningful for her. She could recite whole prayers. She could recite psalms. And, and so um, when she was given the opportunity symbolically, she could recover the expression of her spiritual essence. Right. So spirituality is there. There's a lot of room for uh, people in clinical pastoral care with the deeply forgetful mm -hmm. You know, you must have so many experiences over these decades that you could share, and that would be wonderful, you know, because I think this is a great introduction to the subject. I think we've really covered a lot of ground. The show is getting close to an end, and, and I'm very excited about it because it really dominates a lot of lives of people we, we know or know about. And... I think for all of us to understand it better, even if we don't have any immediate people that we can think of this way, to understand how to bring more life to, the, to, to people who, who need it. And, and that's what I think this is about. This is about respecting life and um, that these people are not dead and that we want to even maybe learn to appreciate them to a greater degree. You know, they can be very insightful. Yeah. I, you know, I, I mean, I, I know this show is almost over, but Willem de Kooning, the great abstract expressionist, one of my friends diagnosed him with Alzheimer's at Cornell Weill, and that was a long time ago. I mean, it's like 23 years ago. De Kooning had probable Alzheimer's for 14 years, 13 and a half years. He was in a in a loft in Greenwich Village, 
He wore the same pair of dungarees with the paint on it that he identified with. They had to make a couple of matching pairs so they could change them, you know. And he would just be there in a chair and he would sporadically rise up, dip his paintbrush in the acrylic, walk up to the easel and he would paint. And there was a posthumous exhibit of de Kooning's work at the Museum of Modern Art. And all the critics panned it. He said, oh, they said he's, he's not anything like he was. He's a husk, he's a shell. But the critic from the New Yorker, who I like, she said, wait a minute, this is a guy who had Alzheimer's disease. And for 13 and a half out of 14 years, he knew who he was. He knew his core identity, symbolically and operationally. And so that's what we need to look for. We need to notice what's going on with people and not write them off. Right. And so um, I want to hear, and I, I do want to hear more from you about this, but if people want to connect with you, you have a, a blog. Yeah, a lot of my work on Alzheimer's disease is at Stephen with a phgpost.com. And um, I do have a blog, stephengpost.com. And I have a, uh, this book, God and Love on Route 80, has a, has a chapter on the deeply forgetful. And then I have this book, which is called, I'll give you the title, it's going to be out in about six months with Johns Hopkins Press. It's called Dignity for Deeply Forgetful People. Oh, good. I love that. I mean, <laughs> that's certainly what we're talking about. Yeah. So, Stephen Post, Stephen G. Post. <laughs> yeah, Stephen with a <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you so much for being a guest again on Energy Stew. It's, it's so wonderful and, and valuable to talk with you. Well, you too. And this stuff's important. Yes. And I'm, I'm so happy to. And hopefully we can continue this. Uh, our audience to bring more of your experiences with it so it can help them understand this better. That would be great. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And this is Peter Roth, your host of Energy Stew at PRN.FM. I can be reached at Peter at Heart River, H E A R T River.org. And you can go to the website, HeartRiver.org, too. That's my school. And I'd, uh, I'd love to hear from you. And thanks so much for listening. <laughs>